Coming up on this episode, the Warriors miss a big opportunity in Dallas, falling to the Mavericks 108-106 on Friday. I'll have a look at that game and go through how Golden State can potentially still push up into the Western Conference 8th seed with just five games remaining in the regular season. Plus, a look at Steve Kerr's biggest conundrum surrounding the front court and Draymond Green, Trace Jackson Davis and Jonathan Kaminga. Yes, welcome back to the Golden State with Mates podcast on this Sunday morning for me in Australia. A disappointing loss for the Warriors yesterday. It's hard to be too judgmental given they'd entered on a six-game winning streak, including a really impressive 133-110 victory over the Houston Rockets on well, Friday, my time, Thursday, US time. Uh, but unfortunately, the Warriors' chances of moving up the standings here took... A pretty big blow, a really big missed opportunity for them yesterday against a Dallas team without Luka Doncic. Of course, the New Orleans Pelicans and the Sacramento Kings also lost yesterday uh, prior to the end result of that Warriors game. So that was a a really pivotal battle. I mean, all of them are right now with now five games left for the Warriors in the regular season. But that, uh, that game yesterday in particular meant a lot after the results of the Kings who fought back against the Celtics but ended up losing by a solitary point. And then the Pelicans somehow lost to the San Antonio Spurs. So I think this was lot this was this loss for the Warriors puts uh their chances of catching the Pelicans probably beyond uh beyond doubt. But I do think there's still a chance that they could overtake the Kings here and I'll get into this in a second. But the Warriors I think were just a little bit flat yesterday. They were obviously shorthanded themselves without uh, Andrew Wiggins, who had a bit of an ankle issue from that game against the Rockets, and Jonathan Kaminga, whose knee tendonitis concerns continue to grow, it must be said, among fans. He's now missed seven games. Initially, we thought that this will be a short-term minor thing, one or two games. It's extended out. Steve said earlier in the week that he'd be back for this back-to-back in Houston and Dallas. He even said after the Houston game that he you know, expected him to play in Dallas yesterday. Didn't end up happening, and so you really have to question what is going on right now with Jonathan Kaminga and his knee issue. So fingers crossed, obviously, have got today off. They then they then face the Utah Jazz uh, tomorrow back home at Chase Centre. Hopefully, JK can be back for that one, but uh, there's a, a big conundrum going on with him uh, and the Warrior front court at the moment that I'll get into soon. But yeah, the Warriors looked flat early. They fell behind by 16 in the first quarter. Uh, the Mavericks led by PJ Washington are really up and about. And uh, fortunately for the Warriors, they, you know, their bench unit again came to the rescue, even pr- prior to the end of the first period, where they went on a 19 2 run in the last four minutes of the first quarter to end up taking a lead after the first 12 minutes. The game from there on was really a back and forth. I don't think either team really got going offensively to their absolute premium level. Uh, and the Warriors were well and truly in the contest over the second, third, uh, and even early fourth quarter. But then the Mavs managed to go on a little bit of a run. They got themselves up nine with four minutes to go, and you thought, okay, this is going to be difficult for a veteran Golden State team on the second night of a back-to-back to be able to get their legs into it and find a way to battle back, but they did. And Steph Curry's uh, jumper with 15 seconds to go ended up tying the game. You thought, here we go, Warriors, a big chance. And unfortunately, they double Kyrie on the ensuing possession and the Mavericks swing the ball nicely and ended up getting uh, a layup from from Washington who had 32 points, a game-high 32 points on the night. Just killed the Warriors, it must be said. Some of his three-point shooting in the first quarter, some of his three-point shooting throughout the rest of the game. Uh, He was a dominant factor for the Mavericks without Doncic and uh, that's certainly a scenario for the Warriors. It has played out pretty frequently, it must be said, throughout this season where you've got role players and maybe calling what PJ Washington a role player is a bit unfair. Like he's a very good player, but you've got guys who kind of, you know, might average 10 to 15 points per game and then find a way to play well above their level when it comes to playing the Warriors. And uh, we know that uh, Fitz on the broadcast likes to mention that a lot. And to be fair, it probably gets a little bit frustrating. Like let's stop saying that role players just play better against the Warriors. That's not necessarily the case. I'm sure there's no stats to necessarily back that up. But you see a performance from Washington like he had yesterday and you think, like, really, <laughs> this is what we're getting in the sixth last game of the regular season, PJ Washington going for 32. But it's what he's capable of, to be fair. He's had these performances 
in the past. I think he's had a couple of 40-point games back in his time with Charlotte. So he's capable, uh, just frustrating that it came against the Warriors yesterday because he's also capable of, of dud performances where he goes less for less than 10 points on you know 2 of 12 shooting. So uh, they were able to keep Kyrie in check a little bit. Obviously, towards uh, the end of the game, they started doubling him and that obviously hurt them on that final possession. And then Clay had a corner three at the buzzer, a reasonable look, like well contested, but a reasonable look uh, to win the game. Obviously, I think the Warriors had no real thought of going for a two on in that scenario and uh, tying the game and, and forcing overtime and having to play another five minutes. So I think it's probably fortunate that, you know, they take that three-point attempt at the buzzer. It's either a walk-off game winner or, or you lose. And uh, unfortunately, Clay came up a little bit short on that one and, and rimmed off. So, uh, a disappointing, disappointing result. I was a little bit surprised with the kind of Steve Kerr's uh, attitude in the aftermath, and even that of Gary Payton II, who, who had a press conference as well. There was a, a positivity to it, and you know Steve talking about how proud he was of the team and how much he loves these guys kind of thing, and GP2 talking about the grit and determination that the Warriors have shown over these last couple of weeks. And that's all fair. Like, they've, you know, they've gone on a six-game winning streak, uh, you know, seven of their last eight games have been on the road. So it has been tough for them. And you have to admire the effort that they've shown to continually battle when they could have easily packed the season in a few weeks ago and said, nah, we're not going to do anything. Let's forget about it. But they have really, they've dug them, they dug their heels in and they fought off the Rockets. The Rockets were obviously really keen on that, what they have, 11 or 12 game winning streak to push up to the Western Conference 10 seed. Yeah, Tari Eason coming out with, you know, his cringy kind of trash talk on Instagram with the Warriors coming out to play. And the fact is that the Warriors have come out to play over the last couple of weeks and the Rockets haven't over their last few games. And on Thursday, the Warriors came out to play and the Rockets didn't. And Ime Yudoka after the game talked about how he thought that some of his players were kind of scared at the moment, deer in headlights kind of stuff. So credit to the Warriors for first for first of all staving off the Rockets because that would have been simply embarrassing for a team that's had so much success over the last decade with a team still led by Stephen Curry for them to fall off the perch so to speak by going down to the 11th seed and letting a young Rockets team overtake them that that would have been flat out embarrassing so the fact they haven't allowed that has been really good. However, you've also got to look at the fact that given their six-game winning streak, they also put themselves back in an opportunity at kind of out of nowhere to try and move up to a top eight seed here. And unfortunately, that game yesterday was a pivotal one in trying to do that. And they came up short. And so as much as Steve and GP2 and whoever else want to talk about, you know, how, you know, how good the Warriors have been and their grit and determination and how proud Steve is of the guys over the last couple of weeks. The pure fact is you're still 10th in the Western Conference and that that game yesterday needed to be a win if you wanted to have any opportunity of getting a top eight seed and then obviously having two opportunities in the playing tournament to try and secure a playoff spot. So the Warriors are still like, the ultimate reality is they're still probably unlikely to make the playoffs at this point. And that's just... It's that's just the cold reality of it. And we can talk about how positive the last couple of weeks. We can talk about how positive the, the whole second half of the season is. Like, you've got to take some of this into context right now, right? Like the Warriors are forty four uh, sorry, forty two and thirty five. And like that is that is good. Like they will end up with more wins than they had last season. They finished what, forty four and thirty eight last season and yet with a sixth seed. They're going to end up with more wins and there's a legitimate, most likely chance that they're going to miss the playoffs entirely. So that just goes to show you the Western Conference and how competitive it is right now. I think I uh, I saw a tweet, I think it was, this, uh, yesterday. The Milwaukee Bucks, second in the East, are further away from the Boston Celtics in the one seed than the Warriors are in the 10th seed of the West to the one seed. Who's one seed at the moment? Denver? or Minnesota or whoever. I don't even know. I Literally, my whole brain has gone away from the top of the, the West. The top, I know the top three are kind of Denver, Minnesota, Oklahoma, whatever order that is, but I couldn't really care about that right now. It's literally obviously about the Warriors and trying to get a playoff seeding, but that does go to show you how competitive it is that the 10th seed is close to the one seed in the West and the two seed is the one seed in the East. Absolutely unbelievable, but it is what it is. Uh, let's try and 
work out here how Golden State can still manage to get the eight seed because while there's a slim hope, we've got to hold on to it uh, while we can. So let's have a look at the schedules for uh, the Kings and the Lakers, right? So the Kings are actually in trouble. The Kings are in trouble. They've lost Malik Monk. They've lost Kevin Herter both for the season, I believe. So they are, like, yes, they've still got Fox and Sabonis, but they've lost four of their last six games. And we all thought that there was going to be a a Lakers-Warriors 9-10 play-in game. I think your money would be on Kings-Warriors right now. And potentially there's a chance that the Warriors host that. Uh, But, yeah, the Kings are battling. So they've got Brooklyn and then Oklahoma both away and then head home to Golden 1 Center to face the Pelicans, the Suns, and the Trailblazers. So right now, they are 44 and 33 on the season. Uh, what what would you give them in those five remaining games? I think it's either two and three or three and two. Now, it could be, I think they beat Brooklyn. I think they, depending on what the Thunder are doing with, I think Shea's missed some time recently, depending on what's happening with him, I think they would go in as underdogs uh, at Oklahoma City. So we'll put it, put them a loss there. Then home to the Pelican Suns and Trailblazers. They could easily lose to the Pels and the Suns. So they lose to the Pelicans and the Suns, beat the Trailblazers in the final game, two and three over the last five games. That ends them with a 46 and 36 record on the season. The Lakers, right. So they have just beaten the Cavaliers. I'm recording this uh, about an hour after the, the Lakers beat the Cavaliers. So a solid win for them, and they have been uh, on absolute fire recently. I think, what is it, like 12 of their last 14 or something like that. Something unbelievable for the Lakers over these last few weeks. Their last four games, so right now they are 44 and – sorry, no, they're not. They're – yeah, they're 44 and 34 right now. Uh, So – they have the Wolves, the Warriors, the Grizzlies, and the Pels. Sorry, they're for, they're forty five and thirty three. I should say not forty four and thirty four. Forty five and thirty three. Wolves, Warriors, Grizzlies, Pels. Grizzlies has to be a guaranteed win. The rest, so that's at Minnesota, and then uh, at Golden State, and then home to the Grizzlies and Pelicans. I think so. Can they lose to the Timberwolves? Yes. Can the Warriors beat them? Yes. Can the Pelicans beat them final game of the season? And maybe there's something on the line for the Pelicans in that as well. So that'll be the thing, like what, what the teams have to play for in these, in these final games or two. Can they go one and three in that stretch? Possibly. Losses to the Wolves, Warriors, Pelicans, Lakers go one and three, possibly. And so that would also put them at a 46-36 record with the Kings. Now, of course, the Warriors right now, 42-35, and 35, so if the Warriors just win their final five games, <laughs> if the Warriors just win their final five games, then all of a sudden there's a chance. <laughs> there's a chance. Well, there's not a chance. If they win their five games and the Kings go two and three and the Lakers go one and three, then all of a sudden the Warriors have the eight seed. So there's, there's the path for you on how the Warriors could try and manufacture a way uh, into the Western Conference AT. It's very unlikely. It, it needs the Lakers and Kings to fall over, essentially. But there's an opportunity there. And the Warriors have a pretty good schedule. They've got two games against Utah, who have absolutely packed it in. <laughs> they have packed their season in entirely. I think they've lost 10 straight games. It'll be 13 of their last 14 they've lost. They have had enough. So you would think that's two pretty much guaranteed wins. They've got the Trailblazers as well, which should be a win, and then crucial matchups against the Lakers, and I think they play the Pelicans as well. So if they can win all five, I mean, they've just gone on a six-game winning streak if possible, and then they get other results to go their way, then maybe there's an opportunity here for them to get up to the eight seed. But more likely than not, I think at this point, they'll face the Kings in a 9-10 playing game, which based on recent form, you would have to be actually fairly confident in, even if it's a goal in one center, the Warriors road record. I think they're 15 and four in their last 19 road games. So given that, you'd actually feel pretty confident. I don't know if the Warriors would go in favorite if it was in Sacramento, but it would be fairly close in the odds, I would suggest. And so maybe you win that one and then you get the Lakers or the Pelicans or whatever else in a second playing game. And who knows? We'll just wait and see what happens. But uh, when you got Steph Curry in a one-off elimination game, 
uh, you have some kind of hope and the Warriors still have some hope. And while they do, we've got to cling on to that. As I said, their biggest conundrum right now in terms of just this team, and it's not just a conundrum for the remainder of this season, whether that be five games or six or seven games or into a playoff series, whatever it may be, it's also a conundrum moving forward for next season and potentially beyond that as well. And I'm talking about the whole front court combination of uh, Draymond Green, Trace Jackson Davis, and of course Kaminga, who's yet to return from that knee tendonitis I spoke about. So there seems to be, when this first happened, like when JK was first out, I thought, yep, this is kind of uh, a minor thing and we'll see him miss a couple of games and then he'll come straight back into the starting lineup. The further this goes, the more and more unlikely now that Jonathan Kaminga will come straight back into the starting lineup. There's a couple of reasons for that. First of all is obviously if he's on any kind of minutes restriction, then it would help if he was probably coming off the bench in that scenario. But secondly, as well, the combination of TJD and Draymond has been spectacular, particularly defensively. And we've seen what Draymond has been able to to do defensively in more of a roaming role uh, out there on defense rather than necessarily being the complete anchor, you know, guarding the opposition centers and stuff like that. If you look at Draymond's stats over these last seven games since TJD's insertion to the starting five, on the season, he averages one steal a game. And over the last seven games, that has risen to 2.3 per game. And there's plenty of that, I think, is to do with the fact that Draymond's seeing this as playoff time. And therefore, we know Draymond Green, he's a playoff performer. He, when the stakes get highest, that's when his best basketball comes out. And I think there's an element of that because he knows right now is essentially playoff time for the Warriors, given where they're at in their season. Uh, but there's clearly also a factor of, and Draymond spoke about this. He had a uh, a really good quote or two with uh, the Athletics' Anthony Slater after the Rockets win, where he was speaking about kind of what he can do defensively in terms of roaming around and the flexibility that the presence of TJD provides him uh, with being able to do the kind of instinctual things out there on defense, rather you know being a help defender. Um, getting in passing lanes, these kind of things, rather than necessarily having to be the complete anchor of a defense where he's guarding the opposition uh, big man and obviously the workload that puts on his body as well. And there's no doubt, I think, that he has to kind of manage himself through those scenarios to ensure that he doesn't completely wear out because he had that back issue a couple of weeks ago where he missed, I think he missed a game or two, whatever it was, through the back issue. And that was kind of the biggest concern of, you know, this is the, the kind of miles and the workload you put on Draymond when he is your primary uh, starting center. And so to have TJD out there is helping in a number of ways, obviously defensively with Draymond's body. Uh, and then obviously, you know, having a, a rolling threat as well for, for Steph and CP and even Clay at times. We know the combination that he and TJD have been able to have so far this season. So you look at this and you think, well, does JK come back into the starting lineup? And is you know is there a way for that to happen? Or is this simply a case of Draymond and TJD must start? And the further this goes, the more it looks like that has to be the case because Steve has come out, you know, after the Rockets win and said, you know, this is a, a situation where we are playing really well. And as a coach, you are kind of, playing with danger a little bit if you want to try and change up what is working well for you. And so I think I would be surprised, I'd be heavily surprised if JK was to start a game for the Warriors again this season. And as unfortunate as that is to say, because he's had a wonderful season, he's probably been the biggest bright spot for the Warriors this season, has at times over the last couple of months looked like the Warriors' second best player. And now we're talking about him going back into a bench role before his injury had started 29 straight games. But you look at some of these numbers here for like the green TJD combination. So the Warriors are fourth in defense in the league over the last seven games. Only twice conceded 110 points or more over that seven game span. The TJD green combination have a 98 and a half defensive rating over, well, just in their minutes together this season, not just over these last seven games. So to put that into context, 98.5 defensive rating, only other the only other Warrior two-man combination to be sub-100 defensive rating this season that's played more than 65 minutes together is 
this is a great pub quiz question that no one would ever get. Guy Santos and Lester Quinones is the only other one. And that is largely because those minutes between when those two guys are on the floor are clearly coming in garbage time against uh, other end-of-the-bench players who obviously aren't that good offensively and therefore their defensive rating looks spectacular when really it's not. So that kind of just gives you an idea of you know how good this TJD Draymond pairing has been because if you go through... I've been having a look at it. Two man combinations for the Warriors this season. Most other defensive pairings from from uh, you know combinations that have played regularly together this season, they're made normally over one ten defensive rating. And so to have sub one hundred is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, and then if you look at their overall net rating, it's plus ten point eight. To be fair, the Green Kaminga combination is plus nine point three. So the overall net rating isn't isn't too different between Green Kaminga and Green TJD. Sorry, the recording just decided to stop for whatever reason. But uh, anyway, the whole point is that like this is not just an issue for the Warriors and Steve Kerr over the last five games here or however long the remainder of the season is, but it's also an issue to be reckoned with heading into next season and beyond because you've got decisions to make on Jonathan Kaminga in regard to a possible extension. And if you're the franchise you do not want to be questioning whether or not you have a starting level player right here when you're also considering giving him an 80 to 100 plus dollar million 100 million dollar plus contract I should say so like you you're not going to be doing that and they they already did that with Jordan Poole, right they gave him a four year 128 million dollar contract when he really didn't have a starting role now based on Clay's level this season, the fact that he moved back to the bench for a period there and Pods came in. Potentially, if JP was still around, he would have taken that starting role. Uh, but clearly, the Warriors thought, no, we don't want to be paying a six-man over $120 million, and therefore they moved off him to get CP3, who, yes, a six-man on $30 million this season, but uh, they can get off him and aren't committed to those four years. So, uh, And then if you, from a JK perspective as well, like, I think he would rightly lay claim to a starting spot and look at and say, you know, look what I've done over these last couple of months. I've averaged nearly 20 points a game since January 1. Uh, I've done that on 54% shooting from the floor. Uh, still plenty of work to do on his rebounding and his defense and stuff like that. But he's an incredibly talented player. And if you're a, a seventh overall pick who's shown the capacity that he has and you're going into your fourth season, you don't want to be questioning whether or not you are going to be a starter in your fourth season. You don't want to be doing that, especially when you've got uh, extension talks. If they go awry and there's no extension, then him pretend, you know, becoming a restricted free agent, you want to be trying to earn as much money as possible on your second contract, obviously, uh, and you don't necessarily want to, to have the issue of whether you're starting or not and how much opportunity you're going to get, which he's had so much you know, prior to these last couple of months throughout his first three years in the league. So it's a, certainly an interesting time. It's going to be one of the, the biggest question marks, I think, for the Warriors over the offseason is what is their front court combination going to look like going forward? And I've spoke about this before. I think this is the Warriors' biggest issue this season is they just haven't had a settled starting five. And we've seen with you know the top teams in the league, the Denvers, the Minnesotas, the Oklahoma Cities, they... They know you know Boston as well in the East, Milwaukee as well. They know what their starting five is, right? Minnesota know they're going out there with Mike Conley, Anthony Edwards, McDaniels, Cat and Gobert. OKC know they're going out there with Shea, Giddy, Lou Dor, Jalen Williams, Chet, right? Denver know they're going out there with Jamal Murray, KCP, MPJ, Aaron Gordon, Nikola Jokic. Like they know what their best five is. Boston know that their best five is Drew Holiday, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Derek White, and and Kristaps Porzingis. They know that. And so this is the thing for the Warriors is I, th- I think they need to try and get a settled starting five as much as they can. Uh, and it's hard. It's really hard for a team when you've got guys at the end of their career who are declining and therefore probably need to transition to the bench at some point, like we've seen with Clay this season. And you've also got young guys on the rise who are starting to to put their hand up and say, yeah, I'd, uh, I've earned or I need a starting spot in this league. So the Warriors, this is the the issue I think that's been, you know, plagued them at times this season. Yes, it's good to have flexibility, but I think going forward, they need to know what their 
their best combination is. And that starts, you know, with that front court, you know, what happens there with Draymond, TJD and Kiminga. So fascinating times for the Warriors over these last five, six, whatever games they play in the end. Uh, but of course, it's going to be a big off season with changes inevitable, but these last five games or so could really showcase, you know, how far that change extends uh, in w- when the off-season rolls around. So certainly fascinating times. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, guys, that would be greatly appreciated. You can follow me at POC252, that's P-O-K-252, on X slash Twitter. You can follow us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Hope you've had a great week. Hope you have a great rest of your weekend, and I'll see you on the next episode, possibly tomorrow after the Warriors host the Jazz at Chase Center.